Hello, I'm Helen Flage and I'm a strategic planner. Um, I've been planning for about 22 years. Um, half of that time was spent in consultancy, um, preparing regeneration master plans for local authorities. And the other half of that time was spent in the Homes and Communities Agency, um, working with local authorities, helping them plan and deliver large scale development. So what I've got to say really is, is based on that experience. Um, so my presentation is about how do we plan, design and deliver better places? So the white paper tells us that our planning system is broken. I don't think it is broken, but I do think the way we plan within it has lost its purpose. And the places that are being built in this country are falling way short of any kind of sustainable place. As many has commented, the white paper does not actually frame the challenges the planning system is trying to address and does not provide any credible or workable solution to improving the way we plan. It continues the myopic view of the government that planning is only really here to deliver housing at speed in the name of growth. So what placemaking challenges do we face? We are not on course to meet our climate change obligations. UK homes are not fit for the future and fall way short of design and energy performance standards. The white paper is silent on climate change. We have witnessed widespread loss and degradation of our wildlife and habitats. So now we're one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. Vast areas of the country are ecological deserts with our soil and water quality degraded. The white paper is silent on the role of the planning system in restoring and making space for nature. We build the smallest homes in Europe with poor design and environmental standards, with the resurgence of the standard house type and particular difficulty in designing well in landscape dominated environments, i.e. greenfield sites. There's much evidence of unsustainable large scale development, dislocated suburbs on green fields being built. New development is frequently located far away from public transport, creating car dependent estates. Transport is barely mentioned in the white paper. So the planning system is delivering unsustainable places. In effect, we have almost stopped plan making. The planning system has become hijacked and turned into a regulatory activity. We have a placemaking crisis, and this must change if we are to deliver sustainable places for the future. The problem with housing delivery, it's not planning. The let win review into build out rates in 2018 was very clear that the fundamental drivers of the slow rate of build out are the homogeneity of the types and tenures of homes on offer and the limits on the rate at which the market will absorb such homogenous products. This is a placemaking issue that strikes at the heart of our housing delivery problem in this country. Only so many people will buy standard house types on standard housing estates. Others will stay in the sec secondhand market where prices continue to rise and are unaffordable for many entrants and young people. The answer is providing more diversification of housing. So to improve speed and accelerate delivery, we need to improve quality of place and housing. The two should go hand in hand. 10 changes we need. Change one. What are we planning? Neither NPPF or NPPG set out what a sustainable community actually is and how to plan, design and deliver one. NPPF is not embedded in a vision and placemaking principles. It is a housing delivery document. The new national design guide is helpful, but it can be and is ignored. We need a revamped NPPF and NPPG document that has the policy objectives and requirements for creating sustainable communities, decarbonisation and nature recovery, we threw out in prescriptive language. Two, we must plan strategically. If we are to build sustainable communities and work towards a green economy and decarbonisation, this must be done at a sensible geographical scale to effectively plan and coordinate housing and employment growth sustainable transport, decarbonise and plan for nature recovery. We must implement effective strategic planning based around larger than local geographies that can plan and coordinate sustainable growth. These could be joint statutory plans or non-statutory. Three, how we identify areas for growth and development. Local planning needs to fundamentally change the way the plan is produced. We need to move away from the developer-led call for sites 
dictating where development goes and introduced a new planning requirement to provide a sustainable settlement study, providing clear evidence on the location, function and quality of natural capital, the built environment, social, physical and green infrastructure, and use this as a baseline to inform the spatial strategy for growth and renewal and the location of strategic sites. A new sustainability test should be introduced that is incorporated into the current test for soundness. A revamped SEA, SA process would inform the strategic planning rather than the current retrofitting and post-rationalisation that is currently often seen. Landowners and developers would then be invited to promote their sites within the growth areas to secure a formal allocation of land. This place making led process should help shift focus away from peripheral sites that require huge new roads to unlock development. The crippling upfront costs of these highways undermines place and design quality and regularly stalls delivery of the development itself. Four, the rediscovery of the master plan. The master plan is a key tool for securing place and design quality. At present, I think there is too much focus on the design code rather than the master plan, which is where fundamental change is required to embed master planning formally in the statutory planning process. The upfront cost of comprehensive master planning for large sites can be prohibitively expensive. And as a result, landowners often take a minimal approach as and when required and usually downstream in the planning application process. A new requirement should be introduced that for all area-based and site-specific allocations over a certain size, a master plan to an agreed specification must be produced for local plan examination and any policy written formalising the contents of the master plan. It will need to demonstrate viability through a site-specific financial viability appraisal, as happens at present, and an infrastructure delivery plan, and be subject to meaningful community and stakeholder consultation and support. I've provided a su suggested specification for this master plan work, which I shall be including in my own response to the white paper. Five, allocations and permissions. For many strategic sites, the evidence base and master plan work produced to secure an allocation is tantamount to an outline application. Much duplication of work is undertaken. For some sites, it should be possible to integrate an outline permission within the local plan approval process, either by way of an outline permission or LDO. The key issue to resolve is how to address the EIA regulations or whatever replaces them to ensure that environmental impacts are effectively mitigated. This process would de-risk the site for landowners and speed up delivery and quality. The key issue here is that there is no one size fits all. The degree of planning and design detail required for strategic sites will depend on the landowner's attitude to risk, access to finance and the local authority's involvement in the project. The very least should be an allocation master plan. In terms of large sites and growth areas, development management would then focus on planning applications to deal with predominantly reserved matters and phased applications within a clear and adopted design framework prescribed by policy. Public consultation on these applications should remain and actually be strengthened by a statutory duty on the applicant to consult. A key issue is, of course, who finances all of this? Again, there will be no one size fits all, but government will need to make extra finance available for this process. In addition to planning fees, especially in its infancy, there is also potential to jointly fund the required master plan work with the council, landowners, Homes England and other stakeholders to share risk and rewards and meet common objectives. Six, design codes or design guides. Outside of the area-based and site-specific master plans, I see no role for design codes. What is required is a comprehensive and locally distinctive design guide that can be used to inform and assess planning applications. The Manchester Residential Design Guide is a good example of such a document and is used to full effect with its introductory requirement to comply or justify. Seven, what skills do we need to support these changes? A collaborative and multidisciplinary place team should be established within unitary authorities building on existing expertise and potentially as a shared resource between district authorities in advance of any local authority reorganisation or devolution. 
These teams should sit between planning policy and development management teams and comprise a multidisciplinary team of planners, urban designers, ecologists, transport planners, landscape architects, sustainability specialists, drainage engineers, surveyors, and consultation officers. They would report to both the chief planning officer and the head of planning policy and head of development management. Their role would be to support the preparation of area-based and site-specific master plans for policy and the local plan and application purposes, and the preparation of the local authority-wide design guide and its enforcement. Eight, training and support. There is a need to upskill all professions in the built and natural environment and provide the knowledge, understanding and skills to be able to effectively plan new sustainable communities. This is not just for planners. A placemaking training course should be devised by the new design quality unit and this should have the full input and collaborative working from all relevant professional institutions and organisations. Nine, resources. The changes will require well-resourced and skilled planning teams. Significant financial support will be required to establish this approach and support the wide range of other planning requirements now expected from local authorities, which will only increase with the move towards zero carbon and decarbonisation. <coughs> 10. Changing the delivery and funding model. Finally, we can change the way we plan within the existing planning system to plan and design better places, but the delivery and funding models we have in this country favour short-term standard house types and road infrastructure. This is implicit in the house builders business model and the funding conditions from government and Homes England, which favour rapid delivery. This is in direct conflict with delivering quality places the current operation of the Housing Infrastructure Fund and the funding of costly upfront roads to unlock and accelerate housing is an example of this model. It takes time and patient capital to create sustainable communities. Without more powers and resources given to local authorities, including development corporation status and access to patient capital investment, building sustainable communities at scale will not be realised. Thank you.